the club owners have presented a proposal to the Players Association. It has been considered carefully today by the executive board, which has reached the following conclusions. I don't know what God's plan is sometimes in life, but the players could have never, ever hoped for someone to come along like Marvin Miller. People would look at him as a towering figure of strength and leadership. The possible use of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service is that it sometimes can provide a, a valuable tool uh, for parties that have been looking at each other too long. He was brilliant, he was calm, he was fair, and undaunted by whatever was put before him. Is there any one issue that is more important to the players than another? There are a number of important issues. Which I think Marvin is the key. He's a skilled, marvelous uh, negotiator. Organized in his thoughts and systematic in his explanation. When he spoke, he was clear. We call upon the owner's representatives to work with the association in order to complete an agreement as rapidly as possible. Great leaders understand what the people want and they guide them towards those directions. By the middle 1960s, players had increasingly become interested in creating an organization that could empower them. Baseball players were in a position that you just go and do whatever your ownership tells you to do. Individually, they had no bargaining power. The players weren't allowed to have a lawyer or an advisor of any kind. When you use the term empowerment, first off, we didn't have any, and we needed to get some. We wanted to accomplish one big thing, talk on an equal basis with management. Meanwhile, the future leader of the Players' Union was living in Pittsburgh with his family, working for the Steel Workers' Union as chief economist and assistant to the president. His life was about to change dramatically. Marvin Miller was recommended. He had a background of negotiation. And I figured if you can negotiate with the owners of steel, you sure as heck could negotiate with the owners of baseball. What interested me most about a small-sized organization starting from scratch was how it could be shaped. It was uh, such a marvelous opportunity to uh, put into play every idea I had about how a democratic union should operate. Marvin was a great listener. It was the single most important thing about him, every single player present. He listened to every single one. This was a labor-intensive industry. The employees are not just employees, they're not just cogs in a wheel who can be replaced. They are the bedrock on which the whole industry is built. Over the years, the players have been led to believe they were expendable. So Marvin had to inculcate in them this notion, no, you have power. You really do have power if you stick together. Marvin was a teacher, a brilliant teacher. He led, and it was fashionable in that day for the writers around the country to say that Marvin made us do things, that we were like sheep, we followed him, and that wasn't the case. Educate for certain was really the single most important thing. He felt you had to know what you were standing up for and what it meant to you. He would draw you in to what he had to say. He would speak quietly, so you'd have to lean forward. <laughs> you have to lean forward and listen. When Marvin came in, job number one was to explain to the players that they could collectively negotiate all terms and conditions of employment. In 1968, Miller helped players secure baseball's first ever collective bargaining agreement, raising minimum salaries and increasing player pensions. He also negotiated exclusive marketing deals that gave the players additional income and also helped fund the union itself. Most importantly, he taught the players that they controlled their own destiny. The first big deal that we got was with Coca-Cola. Find helpful tips and pictures of your favorite players under caps of Coca-Cola. That rid us of being funded by Major League Baseball. We made a lot of progress in those early years, but one of the things that was sacrosanct to the owners was the reserve system. 
Would you conceivably approve any contract that did not have the reserve clause in it? No. You have to remember, these were owners who were used to controlling their labor supply. They owned the place. It was a, a problem that had to be approached. You could not coexist with the reserve clause, in, in my opinion. To my dismay, I found that players had been so brainwashed that the owners' management would take their bats and baseballs and go home. The next salvo in this revolution was about to be heard, one guided by Marvin's foresight and made possible by the trust and rapport he had developed with the players. The guy that stepped out ahead of everybody was Kurt Flood. I tried everything to get him to understand this was no Rose Garden. When I say there's a million and one shot that we can't win this case, I mean it. And he thought about that a little while and he said, but if we won the case, wouldn't that benefit all the other players? I said, oh yes. Shortly after Flood's court challenge had begun, in their second collective bargaining agreement, players won the right to have a neutral arbitrator decide contractual disputes. Marvin considered this the most important achievement of the union's early years because it paved the way for future gains, including the successful challenge of the reserve clause that secured free agency. By spring training, it was clear Messersmith hadn't signed his contract yet when Marvin was floating around, bringing everybody up to speed with what was happening. I mean, if he makes it, this can be huge for everybody. The arbitrator ruled in favor of Messersmith and Dave McNally. What then happens is free agency kicks in. Marvin's greatest accomplishment is free agency. It's the single most important thing that can happen to a major league player. It enabled salaries to skyrocket and bring everybody along for that ride. No one person in the past 40 years changed the very structure of baseball more than Marvin Miller. He is the association's George Washington and Abraham Lincoln all in one. Ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Miller. Costas is right. History will look fondly upon Marvin Miller. A visionary, to say the very least. He saw it in a way that that no one could see it at the time. Throughout the five work stoppages during his tenure, through all of the progress, Marvin Miller, above all, helped players understand the power of unity, as well as their obligation to leave the game better for those players who would someday take their place. It was truly the Players' Union. You look back at Marvin and the players as the pioneers uh, that advanced our game, that's allowed us an opportunity to enjoy uh, what we have enjoyed as players up to this point. And when I think about Marvin, as I often do, he became our leader, he saw our problems, and he conquered them all for us. He was the finest executive director any association could ever hope for or dream to get. He was also the finest man I ever knew.